Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, this is uh, lecture six on regression. Uh, so we're going to cover some uh, theoretical basics of regression from machine learning perspective. Uh, and then we'll take a look at some practical examples with uh, lasso and reach uh, regression. And then a real world task with uh, about LTV uh, prediction. Okay, so we'll first start again with a, a training data set. So uh, we'll have a, a matrix of features and some target vector to, to actually predict. Uh, so we are familiar with it. Uh, we, de we dealt with uh, uh, classification and we had this matrix X and the target vector Y. But now it will be just a bit different. Uh, the values in this vector Y are going to be uh, any numeric uh, values. So Yi uh, can be anything from, uh, from R. Uh, so, so typically in machine learning, this is called a regression problem. S I would say in statistics, uh, by regression, they typically mean something uh, different, some basic uh, ordinary least squares. So if you, in statistics, if you say regression by default, it means uh, OLS, ordinary least squares. I would say it's from statistics perspective. Uh, in uh, machine learning, I would say each time you predict just a numeric feature, it's already called regression. I would say it's an ML perspective. Pers perspective. <coughs> okay, so there might be different algorithms to, to actually predict a target variable which is numeric. And we already covered decision trees. But now we'll uh, indeed step through uh, ordinary list squares. So indeed, it's a very basic and very important uh, algorithm. And uh, we'll also cover regularization. So I would say, again, a machine learning perspective is formalize a problem and then treat it as an optimization. And uh, this perspective uh, will, will lead to such uh, new applications as uh, stochastic gradient descent. I would say it's not an application, it's an another, another approach to regression. Uh, we'll cover it from optimization perspective. And we'll uh, take a look how it actually can be implemented really very, very efficiently and can, can scale to <coughs> really large data sets, like a couple of gigabytes uh, without any actually distributed uh, algorithms. Okay, but first, uh, just a bit of, uh, of theory about that. So I'll keep the very same data set. Uh, okay, let's take a look indeed on ordinary list squares. Uh, first, I'll describe that there is actually a theoretical solution to, to the problem we're, we're going to treat. Uh, and then I would say why we are not satisfied in this theoretical solution and why do we need actually optimization. Okay, so let's just uh, take a look at the really very simple example. Uh, it's called a paired regression. So we'll have just one, sorry, uh, just one uh, feature to predict on. We'll have X and Y. <coughs> okay, let's say X can be something like uh, experience in years and Y might be salary. And we're going to predict salary based on other features, including experience, but now we'll, we're taking a look only on experience. <coughs> okay, let, let it be really very high correlation, so something like that. And we're going to pr uh, predict salary just with a linear function. So again, uh, as we covered in uh, linear, linear models, our prediction, which is typically denoted with hat, will be just a linear function. So w0 plus w1 dot x. Or in a vector form, uh, w transposed x. OK? And again, uh, this sneaky trick to, uh, to actually write it just uh, as a vector product, uh, we are going to add uh, to this vector x, we are going to add a vector of ones. So we'll treat our matrix X as a, 
a vector of ones, one, 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 and so on. And then this feature actually x, x zero, and so on, x, uh, x l minus one. Okay, so uh, this matrix X will be of dimensions uh, L by two. So, but uh, uh, yeah, in general, it will be D plus one. So it, we're just adding this uh, uh, dummy feature of ones. And uh, in this case, we'll, uh, we can treat uh, our prediction just as a uh, inner, pr inner product w uh, uh, with a vector of Ws and a uh, vector of X. Uh, or in a matrix form, it will be even easier. So it will be just x multiplied by w. OK, so uh, x is going to be this matrix of L by d plus 1. So uh, w is going to be a, a vector uh, d plus 1 by 1. Yep, so w is, is just a vector uh, w0 and so on, w, w, d. OK, so in our case, it's just two dimensional. So uh, for d equaling 1, it's going to be just a vector of w0 and w1. OK, so it's, it's about nota notations. And uh, we'd like some uh, geometric intuition as well. Uh, so it's also clear, I think it's familiar to you how it's built. So uh, we'll build a, a predictor in the form of a linear function. So it's going to be something like that. And this w0 is, is treated uh, actually as the intersection of this prediction uh, with the uh, y-axis. So when, when x is equal to 0, then we'll have uh, w0. OK, and w1 will be interpreted as a slope of this, uh, of this line. OK, so we're going to formalize the problem and go actually to optimization. Uh, so <coughs> let's take a look at a single uh, prediction and a real value. So uh, if by chance we've got here some uh, <coughs> x, let, let it be x1, and the real value is uh, this one. So I would say this is y1. Uh, so we'll see some discrepancy between uh, the real value, value and uh, our prediction. And so we'll actually be minimizing the sum of these uh, of uh, squares of these discrepancies. Okay, so this difference is uh, y uh, y one minus prediction for for x one 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 uh, y one with the hat. And uh, let's take a look actually what we're going to optimize to uh, to actually build a, a nice predictor. Okay, so just a small sketch of the same graph. Okay, so we'll have these differences between uh, the real value and prediction. And we'll be minimizing squared sum of these. Well, it's a... Uh, uh, let's think why do we actually need to, to sum squares of these differences. Uh, first of all, why not just, uh, just differences? What if we take uh, this value y1 and its corresponding prediction, take a look at the difference, and then sum with uh, y2 minus y, the prediction for x2, and so on. What's the problem in this case? So if we sum all of these and then minimize. That could be zero if it's zero. Yeah, so yeah, actually not perfect because uh, we can, I would say, uh, make symmetric errors. Like uh, here, with, uh, here we underestimating and at the nearest point will be overestimating by the same margin. And this will uh, in sum give zeros. OK, so this is not going to work. Uh, what if we substitute it with uh, modules, with absolute values? Then it's ni nice better. And it's uh, one type of, uh, uh, of regression. If we 
put absolute values here. It can also be minimized. So it's uh, uh, another type of regression. But math is much simpler if we sum it with squares. So ordinary list squares is actually minimizing uh, the sum. So let's uh, make uh, a nice annotation. So we'll sum squares of all these differences. Yi minus our prediction, I'll substitute it with uh, double transposed xy. So it's uh, our linear prediction for xy. We'll sum all these uh, differences with uh, squares. And uh, we can take a mean. So the sum will be for all the instances from 1 till L. Oops. <coughs> OK, the formula is not ideal in the recording. Uh, OK. So our objective will be called mean, mean squared error. This one, I'll have to re rewrite it. <coughs> so this is squared error. And M here stands for mean. So typically, it's divided over the number of our observations. <coughs> OK, so here we formalized, uh, actually, I would say really briefly, but we formalized the problem. So we're going to give a linear prediction. So this is going to be our model, y i hat. And uh, we formalized it uh, uh, as an optimization problem. So we're going to minimize this criterion. And it will uh, going to produce a nice vector of Ws. So it's the minimization will be over uh, the vector of Ws. OK, but first I would say that uh, there is a nice uh, th uh, theoretical solution to this problem. Uh, so let's take a look at this uh, equation, y equals uh, xw. Uh, we can actually treat it as a matrix uh, uh, yeah, to be if we put an equality sign, so uh, we need to, to put a hat as well. So it's our prediction. So just matrix multipli multiplication of our uh, matrix X by uh, vector W. OK, why not trying to solve it as a, as a matrix uh, e equation? So how can we infer W from here? <coughs> OK, I would say. Uh, from this equation, we would like to express W in terms of uh, x, uh, maybe uh, to the power of minus 1. So we, we might think of inverting this matrix to actually get a real expression for W. But x is not squared. So x has dimensions of uh, L uh, by d pl plus 1. Uh, so we can't uh, I uh, invert this matrix. Uh, but uh, really very sneaky, not, not really a formally strict way to, to get uh, W from here is to multiply it by uh, X transposed. So uh, let's just multiply both sides of this expression uh, by uh, X transposed. Yep, so here we'll have this matrix X transposed X. And now it's square. So uh, its dimensions are D plus 1 and d plus 1. It's a squared matrix. Uh, and now we can invert it and get an expression for w. OK, so uh, w okay. uh, is uh, x transposed x of inverted. And then x transposed y hat. OK, so and it's uh, actually uh, of if we solve uh, uh, this problem as a minimization problem, uh, we can do it analytically. And it, it, it will give the very same solution. So if we take a look at uh, mean squared error and try to minimize it by differentiating, so I'm not going to do that. It's uh, a bit involved. So matrix differentiation, uh, you need to get used to it. Uh, but still, if we do just the same, we will have really similar expression. So minimizing MSE mean squared error. So in a matrix form, it's uh, just an L2 distance between our target y and our linear prediction x 
term, uh, times w. So if we minimize this uh, and uh, approach it uh, theoretically, just uh, differentiate it uh, with uh, respect to w, uh, take derivatives, uh, solve this equation, so we'll get pretty similar result. So I would say identical. So w will be x transposed x to the power of minus 1 x transposed y. So it's an analytical solution of two ordinary least squares, OLS. So this uh, type of matrix is uh, pretty famous. It has a special name. It's a pseudo-inverse matrix. Yep, so pseudo-inverse. So if we can't uh, uh, if, if we can't inverse uh, matrix X because it's not squared, so then we build this type of a matrix and uh, then it it's invertible. Well, so uh, this is an analytical solution, so pretty nice that we can just uh, derive such a formula, and if we have our data X and our labels Y, uh, we can just uh, put it our data into this formula and get an optimal solution for W. Sounds really nice, but unfortunately it's not uh, practical at all. So if we take a look at it, uh, so we need to multiply X transposed by X and then invert it. Uh, then again, X transposed uh, Y. So this step is not practical at all, so because typically uh, we use linear regression when the, uh, our dimensions are high, and this matrix is uh, of size, so this x transposed x is d plus 1 by d plus 1 in, uh, in size, and uh, this operation of inverting a matrix is really very, very computationally heavy. So uh, inverting a matrix, it's an, uh, if a matrix is squared uh, n by n, so the complexity of this operation is about uh, n cubic. So uh, the complexity is going to be cubic in the number of dimensions and uh, actually we'll see that we, we like regression for ability to work in really high dimensions. So if we have, uh, even if we have a hundred of features, uh, then this complexity will be too high. I mean it's, it's it's regard regardless actually of uh, implementations because it's, it's theoretically really very high complexity of inverting a matrix. So we're not going to use this uh, analytical solution. And uh, uh, you see, uh, before we actually come to a practical solution to this problem, uh, let's see what other problems we've, we've got here for such an analytical solution. This matrix might be singular not invertible. Yep, so uh, if determinant here is uh, zero, then we, we can't calculate uh, this matrix. And it's uh, actually a foundation for one of the problems for linear regression called multi-collinearity. Uh, okay, just to, to put it simply, uh, I'll tell you what determinant uh, is. So for a squared matrix, <coughs> A, B, C, D, uh, a determinant of this matrix uh, is <coughs> AD minus uh, BC. And uh, uh, so, it, of course, it can be zero. And uh, inverting a matrix, uh, I'll also write a formula. So if we have A, uh, a squared matrix, uh, A, B, C, D, then uh, we can write and uh, actually a very simple formula for inverting this matrix, but uh, uh, we'll need to divide by the determinant. So the matrix itself will be also simple. D and A uh, s switch places and B and C get minuses. So this will be an inverted matrix, but we need to divide over determinant of this matrix, A, D minus B, C. So the problem uh, is where the determinant is uh, zero and so then we, we can't invert a matrix. And it turns out that uh, uh, this matrix can easily be singular. So 
uh, when can a determinant be zero? A very simple situation when we've got two identical rows. So again, for a squared matrix, uh, if, we, if we have two identical rows, like one, one, seven, seven, then obviously it's uh, singular, the matrix itself. So determinant here will be So we multiply uh, elements on the main diagonal and then minus uh, multiplication of uh, elements on the other diagonal. Okay, so it's, it's zero. And so uh, now closer to machine learning, in our matrix X, we can easily have uh, uh, features that correlate uh, uh, really highly. So if we just uh, add two identical features, then it's already a problem. So uh, in our matrix X, uh, we are going to have some, some features. Uh, let it be uh, feature I and then some feature J. So if Fi equals identically Fj, then there is a problem. So the determinant of uh, X is going to be zero. And so for x transposed x uh, as well. Well, in real, uh, in real task, I won't say that we uh, typically have identical features in our, uh, in our matrix. But still, there is a problem even if uh, these are almost identical. So uh, there's famous stories about some spurious uh, correlations, just occasional correlations. Uh, like movies with uh, Nicolas Cage and number of deaths uh, in a swimming pool. Uh, so the more features you have, the more is the chance that you, just by, uh, by chance, occasionally, you'll have some correlation of some features in your data set. So it will already uh, lead to a problem with this uh, analytical solution. So even if we substitute here with uh, a proximal equality, so if two features are almost the same, then Okay, the determinant will be close to zero. And let's return again to this analytical formula, uh, x transposed x to the power of minus one, uh, x tr transposed y. So if it's close to zero, you see when inverting the matrix will be uh, dividing all the, over the determinant of this matrix. So if it's close to zero, the, the determinant, then uh, these weights are going to be really high even as high as tending to infinity. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, this is the uh, nature of a multi-collinearity problem. And so it can occur really easily. So if we've, we've got some feature like uh, uh, men's salary, then uh, another one, uh, woman's salary, and then another type of a feature would be household salary. Okay, it's almost equal to the sum of uh, these two features. And this will introduce uh, this problem of multi-collinearity. <coughs> so it's uh, really nicely solved with regularization. So we're going to discuss it. Regularization. So in practice, it's not such a, such a big deal. It's, it's better still to avoid such duplicate features in, in linear models. Uh, remember, for trees, it's not, it's not a problem at all. So trees can easily work with such even identical features. Uh, with linear models, we'll, we'll discuss two types of regression based on regular, regularization. Uh, and in practice, you can ignore uh, identical features, but still, uh, if you'd like uh, optimization to be better, uh, just get rid of identical features. Okay, so we'll quickly return to regularization. For now, let's just uh, take a look at this uh, optimization problem. So we are not going to solve this problem analytically. Instead, we'll just, we'll just use optimization uh, to solve exactly this task, MSE. And we'll be minimizing this expression. Okay, though there is a theoretical analytical solution for this problem, let's just apply gradient descent to, to this problem. Okay, so uh, I would 
I would start with a gradient descent as the simplest uh, optimization procedure, uh, but many more optimization algorithms exist uh, out there. Only that gradient descent is uh, very, very simple, and its stochastic version uh, leads to this uh, scalability to very large data sets. <coughs> okay, the idea of gradient descent uh, in a nutshell. Uh, so we are going to optimize some function. Uh, let it be just a parabola. Uh, if the function is really very simple, we can find analytically this solution. Let's find, uh, let's actually find this minimum. Uh, but a numeric alternative will be uh, just some iterative procedure to actually reach this point of minimum. So we'll start just with a uh, random value. Let's say it's argument uh, again x and y. Uh, We'll just uh, throw a sample a uh, random value of x. It's going to be our x at step 0. And then we'll introduce some uh, procedure for updating this value in order to come closer to this minimum. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll use derivatives here. So uh, remember, uh, for such a simple graph, uh, there is a nice geometric interpretation of a derivative. Uh, so a derivative will be uh, this line, which has only one intersection uh, with the graph of uh, function y. Uh, so the intersection will be just in this point, x0. And uh, the angle of this line actually uh, is equal to, well, the tangent of, of this uh, angle, this tangent of alpha, is uh, equal to the derivative of, of this function in this point. And so if the uh, derivative is uh, uh, less than zero, then the function is decreasing and uh, on the contrary. Okay, so if we estimate derivative here at this point, uh, we know that we, uh, we shall move to the right to actually minimize the function. So we'll take a look at der derivative of uh, this function y with respect to x and we'll take its value in our point uh, x0. We'll see that it's uh, less than zero. Then we, we need to, I would simply write, we need to increase x to make uh, y uh, less. <coughs> okay, and actually this will be an iterative procedure. We'll, ma we'll make just a small baby step to, this, uh, to the right. And we'll have x1 uh, after we, we've done this step. And then we'll, uh, again, estimate the derivative in this point. Again, this will be some tangent line, uh, just a geometric interpretation. And then we'll conclude that we still need to go to the right. And th then, uh, finally, we'll reach this point. Okay, the exact expression for weight updates will be, again, really simple. At, uh, uh, suppose we are at iteration uh, t, so we'll have some value x t, and we'll get uh, value x t plus 1 from uh, the previous one. Uh, by calculating the derivative, I would write uh, y, y prime. It's going to be a derivative. Uh, t means at step t. And we, go, we need to go to another direction, so we'll put a minus here. Yep, so if a derivative is uh, uh, negative, we increase the argument and vice versa. So minus, uh, the sign is minus here. And just a coefficient of proportionality, so typically it's uh, designated with uh, eta, or, well, in a neural networks world, it's uh, more often it's lambda. Okay, I'll write lambda. Lambda will be uh, just a numeric value. It's, uh, so you see it's just a coefficient of proportionality, how much we need to, to step uh, after we've calculated uh, the der derivative. <coughs> okay, it's not really very trivial to, to set this lambda. So uh, let's just illustrate this uh, alternative. If we set a high lambda, what happens? And what if we set a too small value for lambda? Okay, if, if lambda is very, very low, I would say 10 to minus 7, uh, then we're doing the right thing, but uh, too slowly. Yep, so we'll start from somewhere and then we'll do 
very very small baby baby steps uh, and it will take very long time to actually reach this minimum if lambda is high uh, then there is uh, an even better uh, even worse problem uh, then we can even fail to to find this uh, local minimum we, we can fail to converge so at this point we'll uh, estimate the de derivative and understand that that we need to go to the right uh, but uh, let's say we've done a very huge step and uh, at the next step we're also estimating the derivative but if lambda is too high then we'll we'll jump here and uh, the method will actually uh, diverge so it's not going to find this uh, nice minimum so it will jump here and there uh, and actually uh, n nothing good here okay so we need to find lambda uh, somewhere in between and a nice value for that and uh, a nice heuristics is making lambda uh, actually uh, sorry actually changing lambda and so this uh, learning it's called learning rate uh, a simple heuristic is just to make it uh, inverse proportional to the to the number uh, to the current uh, uh, index of your step yep so we start with uh, large values of lambda so when our uh, loss function so in this case it's y we need to minimize uh, a loss function when we see that it's uh, awful that the values are very very high we can uh, optimize quickly and make uh, large steps so initially lambda will be high but then when we, when we find regions of uh, nice values uh, we uh, decrease lambda and make more accurate more tiny steps until we reach uh, this minimum Okay, so it's a very basic uh, optimization procedure and uh, we're going to apply it actually to uh, minimizing mean squared error. So it's, it's known from the field of optimization and it's a really very, very, uh, very general procedure. When you are able to quickly calculate derivatives, then you can apply gradient descent. Okay, so in our case, when uh, minimizing mean squared error, we just uh, actually need to be able to calculate its derivatives with respect to everything we are optimizing on. So j with respect to Ws. So I'll write this expression a bit more clearly. Uh, in our case, with just one predictor, uh, we'll have uh, our uh, prediction will be just linear in a form of W0 plus W1 multiplied by X, Xi. So this is going to be, uh, uh, okay, the expression for our mean squared error. Okay, now we'll be minimizing it with gradient descent. And so actually the, the challenge here is only to calculate derivatives with respect to these coefficients w0 and w1. So eventually we'll, we'll need to find nice values for w0 and w1. So it will be just the same. So we'll have uh, the very same uh, graph. Uh, we've got two arguments here, W0 and W1. And we'll have this function MSE, mean squared error. Actually, it's a sum of, uh, sum, uh, sum of squares. So if you analyze this expression, uh, just a bit of linear algebra, I will only tell that uh, the graph of this function is, uh, is going to look as a paraboloid. So it's pretty, pretty similar as what we've just seen. So only that will have a, this paraboloid. And the procedure actually is uh, just the same. So optimization will start with just some random val uh, values of W0 and W1. So we'll start somewhere from here. It will be the point W0, W1 at step zero and so on. And uh, then we'll be gradually uh, reaching this optimum. As an optimization task, is, uh, it's pretty easy because uh, this function has only one uh, optimum and it's uh, obviously a global, global minimum. Yep, so we'll have as a paraboloid, it, it will have only one uh, global uh, minimum uh, and will actually eventually find this global minimum with uh, 
uh, with this procedure. <coughs> yeah, uh, just a couple of words more about gradient descent. Uh, if you think about the problems it might have, uh, these are local minima. Yep. So if you if your function is not uh, convex uh, or, or concave, then you you can have such a problem that if you have a local minimum and a global one, then if you start from some random point, you can eventually finish in a local minimum, and it's it's not going to be that nice. So if our first point x zero is here, then we'll launch gradient descent and we'll finish at this point, but not at the global uh, minimum. <coughs> okay, so uh, we're not going to discuss all the tricks uh, we need to use, uh, but uh, a couple of words how it's, it's actually solved. Uh, there is some an uh, analogy with uh, physics and uh, with uh, uh, a concept of uh, momentum. So uh, actually, you can think of uh, this procedure, of this gradient descent, uh, as some uh, physical process. Uh, we can have gravity and uh, some metal ball actually uh, riding the maybe riding the hill and uh, finding some uh, uh, some local optima. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I'll show the picture from our article because there's uh, a very nice uh, interpretation for gradient descent. Okay, if you just go to ML course AI, the quickest way, uh, it's also explained in uh, in this one, in this topic, topic eight. Yeah, so. It's me in far away in Russia, snowboarding in Sheragesh. It's uh, really very, very far away. So if, if Moscow is uh, maybe 3,000 kilometers from here, Sheragesh is six more thousand kilometers to the east, but it, it's perfect. It's a very popular place. Uh, millions of tourists uh, go there uh, every winter. Okay, I'm just showing this picture to, to drive an, an, some an analogy uh, for gradient descent. If you're standing somewhere in the mountains and you need to quickly reach uh, the valley, uh, I don't know, you're hurrying somewhere, you're un uh, hungry, and you'd like to, to go down as quickly as possible, uh, then gradient descent will be, uh, so actually estimating the derivative will be analogous to estimating the slope uh, in a current point. Yep, so, uh, What's actually a gradient? It's a generalization of uh, derivative. Uh, so it's written here, a gradient is a vector of all partial derivatives of a function. And uh, it's just analogous to uh, estimating the slope in the current point, and you just make a step uh, in the direction of the, the highest slope, uh, if it's compatible with life in this case. Yeah, uh, and you do it in in each point. So intuitively, if you're riding and choosing the uh, the most dangerous path with uh, the biggest slope, so it's actually somewhat analogous to estimating uh, derivative in each point. And but we also have momentum. Yep. So if you're riding, you you, you don't start from scratch at every point. You've got some uh, momentum, and it's actually uh, simulated in optimization uh, problem. Uh, so. If it's a ball riding some surface, then at this point it uh, it can have some actually velocity or momentum, and it can uh, eventually jump over this uh, local minima, and it's okay. It, it can continue its uh, its process and find a global one. Uh, so, in in topic eight, we'll cover uh, some variant of gradient descent. This SGD stochastic stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and what I've described here, it's called uh, momentum. So it's actually it, Nesterov. The most famous guy here is, uh, well, Russian. Uh, Nesterov, Nesterov momentum. And it's uh, this procedure is still very, very popular. And for 
all modern neural nets, though we, though we have more complicated approaches, more uh, advanced uh, optimization algorithms, but still stochastic gradient descent with momentum, it's uh, what, what you typically apply for neural nets to uh, optimize their weights. <coughs> and just one more notation that for uh, neural nets, such local optima, uh, like this one, I would say mostly they're good enough. So you don't actually need to find uh, uh, this global optima. I would say uh, typically it's, yeah, for neural nets might be good enough. So you, your optimization just ends up in, an, in a local optima. And uh, okay, empirical studies just show that uh, the accuracy or any other metric won't be improved too much if you j actually find global optima instead. And uh, for neural nets, uh, actually local optima is not such a big deal. Uh, there are much more uh, problems. Uh, well, so if in higher dimensions, you, you don't have so many local optima. So if you think about it, uh, a more serious problem will be a saddle point. Uh, yeah, it's a slight detour from our uh, regression problem, but, but it's nice to actually understand what optimization problem you encounter with neural nets because uh, all the humanity wasn't able to actually solve it for, for some 30 or 40 years. So th the main problem for neural nets was saddle points. So if your function uh, is too flat in some region, maybe then it's continuous decreasing, but this region is also very dangerous for your optimization. Uh, because you've got almost zero derivatives in this region. Yeah, and remember your uh, updates are uh, actually proportional to your to the derivative. Okay, at point t plus one, yeah, we make a, some, some step proportional to, to the derivative of uh, w. Uh, okay, sorry, of your loss function with respect to w. Okay, we actually need some concrete W, some uh, dimension G. Okay, so you see if, if this is uh, coordinate WG and loss function is very flat in this region, so this derivative is going to be almost equal to zero and there are no updates here. And so uh, momentum also helps here as well. So if it's a ball riding down the hill, then at this point it has some velocity and it, the optimization continues. Okay, we're not going to study mathematically momentum here, but just to, to, real, to actually understand this, these saddle points occur much more often in, in higher dimensions. Uh, a very, very approximate way of re reasoning about that is that uh, just suppose that your function uh, randomly is increasing or, or decreasing. Let's just say with probability uh, one half uh, to the left from this point, it either increases or decreases. And uh, a local, uh, local minimum is uh, such a point where the function is uh, uh, increasing in every direction. Yeah? So if you, have, if you have multiple dimensions, then uh, for a point to be a local minimum, the function needs to increase in every, every dimension. And suppose you've got uh, millions of dimensions, it's really unlikely that uh, the function is going to, uh, to, to increase in, in every dimensions. So saddle points uh, are much more frequent in higher dimensions, and these were actually the problem for, for neural nets for, for quite a while. Okay, but let's return actually to uh, solving ordinary least squares uh, with gradient descent. Well, so uh, again, this criterion, I'll ignore uh, dividing here. Uh, it uh, doesn't influence the problem actually. Uh, so we've got such a function that we're going to minimize. Dividing over the, uh, over the number of observations is just a constant, uh, so it doesn't influence the minimization problem. Uh, well, to do so, you, you just need to calculate derivatives of, of this function. I'll call it L. 
So you need a derivative with respect to w0 and uh, almost the very same derivative with respect to w1. When you are able to calculate such derivatives, then it means uh, you can launch gradient descent. Uh, so uh, the derivative here, you see a big, a big sum. So this big sum will remain. Uh, and then the very same expression, but without the square. Y i minus uh, w0 minus w1 x i. Oh, sorry, without, without a square. Okay, and minus one from here, right? Then the derivative uh, of the inner expression here with respect to w0, uh, so then it will, will be minus one. And the derivative with respect to w1 is uh, almost the same. Uh, so it will be a big sum, uh, the very same expression. But now uh, the derivative uh, with respect to w1, we, we, we see with that we've got a coefficient xy here. And we've got our real data, so xy is just a number. Uh, and so we'll multiply by minus xi here if we differentiate with respect to w1. And you see we've got just analytical expression for, for these derivatives, and then we can launch optimization uh, process, uh, so actually gradient descent. <coughs> you can think that uh, to estimate these derivatives, we still need to uh, these uh, sums. What if our data set is very large? Uh, so to calculate derivatives at every point, we, need, we still need to, to perform this summing over all of your data set. So if L is uh, much greater than, well, a mathemati mathematician will write much greater than one. But uh, speaking about the uh, practical side, I, I would say if your data set is larger than uh, maybe 10 to the power of 5, uh, 100,000 observations, then it's going to be really, really slow. At each step, you estimate derivatives by calculating something over all of your training data set. And here, will uh, SGD will come, a stochastic gradient descent. Speaking very informally, SGD, I'll, uh, I'll write it in, in red here, SGD is just getting rid of all this sum. We'll uh, process elements one by one, and this, I this will be really very, very quick, uh, but we'll do it in, in, in two weeks. Yeah. For now, we, we've got analytical expressions for derivatives, and then we actually can uh, find a nice minimum for this ordinary least squares problem. <coughs> okay, but we, we've seen that uh, if we've got almost identical features, it's uh, no good. So we actually uh, have this problem of multi-collinearity. Uh, again, this analytical solution, why is it actually bad? So uh, if x transposed x is uh, almost singular, uh, then you see uh, while, while inverting a matrix, we divide uh, by a determinant of this matrix. So if it's close to zero, uh, w's will be very, very high. And there is a problem with interpretability. So uh, suppose we are uh, building some simple linear model, again, like predicting salary. So uh, our estimation of salary will be some linear function of uh, w1 for uh, x1. Let it be x1, maybe it's uh, experience and so on. Maybe there, is, uh, there are some more predictors here. But suppose if this w is uh, very high, then, uh, well, it's not uh, very well interpreted. Yep. So suppose your, your prediction is, is going to be 10 to the power of 8 shall be multiplied by experience in years, uh, then minus 7, 10 to the power of 6, uh, I would say age, and so on. So if uh, these weights are very, very high, uh, th it's no good. It's no good in terms of optimization, but in, as well in terms of interpreting your, actually your linear model. Uh, I'm skipping 
all these numerical problems with uh, actually calculating this expression, but uh, in case of multicollinearity, there are couples, dozens of reasons why it's uh, not stable numerically. But I would say I just, I'm just delivering this uh, basic idea of regularization. We are going to control these weights W. We are not going to make them really very high. <clears throat> okay, and how it helps with, uh, uh, with tackling multicollinearity? So if we have uh, in this matrix X, a couple of almost identical features. Uh, I would say salary male and, uh, and salary, not salary, female. Okay, let, let, let's think that they're correlating. Uh, okay, again, Fi and Fj, and they're almost uh, identical. Uh, <clears throat> how can we actually tackle this? No, uh, the first question is, what's the problem? The problem is that uh, in this case, to actually tackle uh, this problem of uh, dividing over the zero determinant, uh, this solution will lead to a very non-pleasant case where these uh, coefficients will be very, very high. So uh, it will end up, the linear model will end up with some uh, linear combination. Uh, wy xy plus wj xj. Uh, these are just corresponding. Okay, and uh, typically these weights will be very, very high and of different uh, signs. <coughs> so yi might be something like plus 10 to the power of 12, and uh, yj might be the same but minus. There are some uh, reasons for such, such a solution. But uh, such high weights of different size, sizes, uh, sorry, of different signs, uh, will compensate for for this uh, singularity, and it's uh, totally no good. It makes your uh, weight, weights unstable. It there is no interp nice interpretation for that uh, at all, and uh, it it affects other features uh, in in proper way as well. So actually, these are uh, two basic motivations for actually uh, enforcing these weights to be not f too high. So we are going to solve the very same problem, uh, but uh, limiting uh, absolute values of these weights. And so in a nutshell, regularization uh, arises in the very same problem. Uh, so we are minimizing MSE. But now let's say that we are uh, restricting our weights W uh, to be less or equal to some, some constant. Let's, let's call it C. <coughs> what it means, uh, a, a very nice geometric interpretation will be the following one. So if we uh, create a, a bit different graph, so this is going to be a feature space, so x, feature xy, feature xj, and, and so on, uh, then what actually gradient descent does? So uh, let's plot, uh, let's make a counter plot of uh, loss function. So remember this parabolaid, and now we are uh, taking a look from above, and uh, we can depict counter plots. So, so these are uh, lines of equal values of this uh, function L. So, so maybe our function L is very high here, uh, 10 to the power of 7. And on this line, uh, it has everywhere the same value. And uh, then I if we come closer to some global optimum, then uh, our function is lower, but uh, each time these lines represent some surfaces, some, okay, some lines with uh, equal values of this lo loss function. Okay, and gradient descent will be interpreted in the following way. So we'll start with some uh, random point somewhere here. This is going to be uh, x0. And then gradient, uh, actually estimating the gradient is actually calculating this, uh, this vector. Uh, 
so uh, the gradient is is going to be the direction of the uh, fastest grow growth of the function. So gradient is uh, pointing somewhere here, and if we go in the inverse direction, so the gradient with the uh, with a minus sign, so uh, this red line will show us the direction where we'll step. And again, a gradient of a function is just a vector of all its partial derivatives. So it's a vector of the very same uh, length d, how many features we've got. So it's uh, df with d, uh, actually the, uh, its first component. Uh, so if we, if we call them x's as here, so it will be df over x1 and so on, df with respect to xd. So it's a gradient. And uh, actually there is a property that uh, gradient is perpendicular to these counterplots at each point. Uh, well, and uh, if we take a look, the optimization, okay, it started to depict it in, in red. So it will go like this. At each point, we'll be estimating gradient and uh, go towards anti-gradient and uh, slowly we'll reach this uh, optimum. <clears throat> okay, but we want to restrict our weights and uh, there is nice interpretation for that. Uh, I'll draw it again. Not a very nice plot, sorry. Okay, so we are going to keep our weights in some region. So uh, this expression is nicely interpreted. Uh, again, purely geometric interpretation. So what I've written here, yeah, I forgot two here, it's an L2 uh, norm. So it's just simply, it's, we can rewrite this expression as W1 squared plus, uh, and so on, plus WD squared shall be less than or equal to c squared. And c is just a sum constant. If you take a look, it's an equation of, uh, of a surface. Yep. It's, uh, uh, if we have an equality sign here, that's, that's an ex expression for, equation for a, a sphere. And uh, this depicts uh, the, this inner part of the sphere. So, uh, I will substitute here, I will write our weights here, y, uh, wi, wj. So we'll, we'll be minimizing the very same function. Yep, so uh, these counter plots are still the same. And our procedure is intended to reach this uh, global optimum. But at the same time, we've got this limitation that can be geometrically expressed like, like this. So we've got a sphere of radius C. So this is going to be a sphere. And we force our weights to lay in the inner region of this sphere. Yep, you see? So this is going to be C, what I called here. So we just make, uh, uh, so our weights are now obliged to, to stay here in this region. And in this way, uh, the procedure will come to some, uh, uh, so uh, the procedure will try to balance these two requirements to actually find uh, this uh, global minimum, but still stay in this red region. And it will end up somewhere here. So this will be our final solution, which is typically denoted with a star. You see, we didn't reach the global uh, optimum, and uh, we've already discussed uh, uh, overfitting. So uh, actually, it, it's not that bad that we didn't reach this optimum. It means that with with this training set, we didn't find the perfect solution, and it's it's nice because we don't overfit actually. So we'll stay, uh, we'll finish our optimization procedure with some imperfect value, and it's fine because we are fitting the training set. Uh, and still we uh, satisfy this requirement of actually keeping uh, the weight uh, low. So it will not end up with uh, some uh, extremely high values of W. <coughs> okay, and uh, purely from an optimization perspective, this is uh, 
similar to just modifying uh, our criterion. So in optimization, it's called conditioned uh, minimization. Yep, so we're minimizing some function, but we've got some extra condition. And uh, a very nice fact is that we can substitute it with, uh, again, just a minimization procedure, unconditioned, without any conditions, just by uh, changing this criterion a bit. So if we make our criterion MSE plus uh, this norm of W with some coefficient lambda, then we can just minimize this expression. And it will be the same. Yeah, sorry, it's a uh, very popular confusion. So this lambda is some, somewhat different now. It's not a learning rate. It's uh, this regularization coefficient. <coughs> OK, and I'm currently explaining uh, L2 regularization. That means that we uh, here it's an L2 norm of our weights W. OK, so we've uh, substituted our criterion MSE for something else. Uh, what's the reason to do so? Uh, these two optimization tasks are just equal, but let's take a look at this uh, uh, balance. Um, so what does it actually introduce, lambda? Let's uh, take a look at lambda uh, being very small. I would say <coughs> something like 10 to minus 7. If it's very, very small, then it, uh, it's almost the same uh, as we had previously, without any regularization. Yeah? So it's, uh, if lambda is too small, then we can uh, minimize MSE uh, as, we, as we want to, but weights can be really high. Yep. So if lambda is too small, uh, then MSE uh, is crucial in a way that uh, it influences our final objective uh, much more. Yeah, well, typically the sum of these two, what we actually are minimizing, it's typically called an objective. Yeah, so if lambda is very, very small, our objective is almost the same as MSE. And we've got what we, what we had previously. But if lambda is too small, then actually MSE doesn't play any role in our objective, uh, doesn't have any role. And so actually now weights are crucial. And you see there is some balance. So lambda is going to be a hyperparameter. So the model is not going to learn which uh, values of lambda to use. We are specified uh, externally. And so it's a hyperparameter. So there is a distinction between these weights w that are typically called uh, parameters. I'll just write params. Uh, so the model can actually learn good values of this w uh, via this optimization procedure. But uh, unfortunately, it can't learn lambda. So instead, on the contrary, lambda is a hyper parameter. Yeah, there is a subtle uh, linguistic uh, distinction between these, but uh, distinguishing parameters versus hyperparameters, we, we just uh, underline whether these can be learned via the process or they are settled externally by us. <coughs> so in decision trees, we didn't have any internal parameters, but we, uh, we had uh, hyperparams like max depth, so a decision tree cannot learn a good depth uh, or mean sample sleeve. These were all hyperparameters and will have similar in, in regression. So this regularization coefficient. OK, so we'll be setting this actually via cross-validation. Uh, again, we'll be building these plots. Uh, so <coughs> you see this balance. If uh, lambdas are too small, then uh, it's just like ordinary list squares. Uh, if lambda is too high, then uh, weights actually dominate uh, the minimization procedure, and we can end up with very, very low weight, and we can uh, underfeed. So we'll have uh, pretty much the same uh, curves. So a crystematic uh, picture will be like that. So we, we have some, some train loss. 
and some validation loss. Yeah, so this green one is going to be our training loss, uh, red one is going to be validation loss, and at some point we've got overfitting. So it, these are called validation curves, and they are very, very general. So uh, general in terms of this is typically some loss function, and it can be anything depending on your task. And this is going to be anything in, term of, in terms of model complexity. And it turns out that regularization is some, somewhat connected with complexity. So it's, uh, and I would say, in something restricting model complexity. So uh, one over this coefficient lambda will serve as a measure of complexity. So if lambda is uh, very, very low, so we are only minimizing uh, squared error, and we can actually overfit, find a perfect global uh, minimum. Uh, so this will be this region where we've optimized uh, our criterion too well. But if lambda is, on the contrary, too high, uh, then we are restricting the weight too much, and uh, the model can learn something really primitive, and it will underfit this region. And then uh, we'll have some perfect values of uh, lambda, regularization uh, hyperparameter, so we'll just set it via cross-validation. <coughs> okay. And uh, just a bit more about regularization. Uh, again, there is a analytic solution for uh, for the case of L2 regularization. So it turns out that this lambda appears uh, in the very same expression, but, but like this. So we're not uh, inversing x transposed x, but we are adding this lambda. So in a matrix form, we need to put identity matrix here uh, and the very same x transposed y. So actually in case of L2 regularization, uh, there is again an analytical solution. Uh, again, I, I will write one more uh, Russian surname. Uh, yeah, in, in East, uh, Western literature, they typically forgot about uh, this name, Tikhonov, and call this just L2 regularization. But it was introduced by Soviet scientists, and it didn't deal at all with uh, machine learning or op optimization. It was intended to solve just uh, systems of linear equations. So the very same problem in systems of linear equations. So if you've got an equation a times x equals b, uh, then uh, it's easily solved uh, by inverting this matrix A. Uh, and, and the very same problems uh, if uh, A is uh, singular. So actually regularization was introduced to, to tackle this problem in linear, in systems of linear equations. Uh, So L2 is uh, L2 regularization is uh, actually arised uh, in this in the domain of linear algebra. <clears throat> okay, and uh, the only thing before we make a small break is uh, another type L1 regularization. It's uh, very practical, so it will lead to some solutions uh, that are often used as feature selection. Uh, that's why I'll describe it. So the most, two most popular types of regularization are L2, so re regularization for just uh, simple linear models. So in case of L2, it will be called rich, rich regression. And uh, in case of L1 regularization, th this will be called lasso. And so we're going to discuss it. Why do we need another type of regularization? Yeah, and also the origin of this term, uh, rich. Uh, so again, from this analytical solution, uh, we are uh, just adding something to the main diagonal. So if this is uh, x transpose x, if this is close to singular, then another interpretation of this procedure is to take a look at this huge matrix. Uh, x transpose x, and we are taking a look at the main diagonal, and we are adding this uh, small term, or maybe not small term, lambda. So we are doing plus lambda for every single 
uh, element on this main diagonal. And in some sense, it's a ridge. Ridge, uh, well, actually, I don't know of any other applications for, for this word, but it's some sort of uh, this uh, tough thing. Uh, Okay, I'm not that good in English to, uh, to explain what this analogy, but uh, ridge, you know, if you take a look at the horse, it, it will have some, some sort of... Uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, some sort of an ongoing part uh, on her back. Some triangular, this triangular thing is actually a ridge and uh, somewhat analogous is going on in this matrix. We are just adding some something to the main diagonal. Okay, but L1 regularization is uh, also very practical. So let's discuss it from uh, optimization perspective. The very, very same idea, but we'll be uh, minimizing again MSE, but with another condition, we'll be just restricting uh, absolute values of Ws. So all W is, so this is just an absolute value. So actually, the sum of all uh, Ws is going to be limited with some value. Again, we can call it C or maybe C prime. What's the point of doing so? Uh, again, we can rewrite okay, L1 regularization. So this was a uh, conditioned optimization problem. We can uh, rewrite it in the very same way of an unconditioned uh, optimization problem, if we introduce a new objective, it will be the very same MSE, but now lambda plus the sum of all absolute values of our Ws, and W from one to the number of features, D. And we'll be minimizing this instead. Okay, so this expression is actually called an L1 norm. That's why uh, L1 uh, regularization. If you put two bars here, this will be L1. So the designation for that. What's the point of changing it? Uh, so for rich regression, again, we, we had nice uh, uh, analytical solution. In this case, we're not going to have a nice analytical solution, but it's more practical. So. Again, a geometric interpretation for that will be, uh, again, these counterplots. But now uh, I will rewrite again this uh, conditioned problem. We are minimizing MSE and uh, keeping track of this, the sum of absolute values of all these Ws. We are making this sum lower than some constant. Okay, so geometrically, this will look like another type of uh, region. Uh, you can think of just two variables if we build such a plot. Absolute, absolute value of W1 plus absolute value of W2. If we restrict it with some value, we'll actually get some region uh, like, like this one. So now our weights will be restricted to, to be here. Actually, in a region of made of several hyperplanes. Oops. <clears throat> now the solution will change. So again, we we're trying to find this global uh, optimum, but uh, a really non-trivial uh, part, uh, and actually the fact uh, is that uh, the solution will end up in some point like like this one. Uh, where some of the features are just zero. So, yeah, I depicted it with, uh, with a star. So this is going to be maybe this one or another one in the corner. So now these are going to be optimal solutions. It has to do with simplex method in optimization. And uh, there are some uh, motivations for this optimal point not being here somewhere in the middle, but on the edges. <clears throat> and now the situation is, uh, High, so we've got a high, high dimensional feature space and uh, actually the optimization will end up with just many, many values being exactly zero. 
And it's very cool because we can do feature selection with that. So uh, Lasso, actually, this uh, abbreviation st stands for List Absolute Shrinkage and Selector Operator. So, well, this shrinkage is, uh, well, I didn't use this word yet, but this is the idea of controlling our weights, making the, these small. So we shrink, shrink weights, we uh, make them uh, be small, it's shrinkage. And this S is selector. So this is cool. Uh, we can actually choose features, select features in our uh, data set just with a model, with, a, uh, with less so. <clears throat> so comparing uh, these two types of regularization, uh, in terms of uh, uh, minimizing MSE, they're almost the same. Uh, L2 tackles a bit to better multicollinearity, uh, but L1 uh, is almost always used for feature selection. So L1 and L2, I would say in terms of accuracy, almost the same, but uh, the main advantage of L1 is feature selection, and L2 copes a bit better with uh, multi collinearity. And again, this is called less so, and this is called rich regression. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, have a small break, and then we'll quickly take a look at, at practical applications of less so and rich, and then uh, this task of LTV prediction. <clears throat> 